Words have never been my specialty, because when I was growing up, I happened to have a, a slight uh, speech problem. So I grew up always trying not to talk. I was always sort of an A, B student, but I dreaded getting up to speak. And with age, you adapt and relax and realize life's not as uh, terrible as it seemed. I mean, I had a good childhood, but it's still the business of communication is always difficult. That is the great American artist and 2012 National Medal of Arts recipient, Ellsworth Kelly. And this is Artworks, the weekly podcast produced by the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. Ellsworth Kelly is one of the most celebrated and widely influential artists of the second half of the 20th century. He rose to acclaim in the 1950s with work that explores the dynamic relationship among color, structure, and surroundings. He first became known for his bright, monochromatic, multi-panel works. He was one of the first artists to use irregularly shaped canvases, and this, along with his layered reliefs, sculptures, and drawings, consistently challenges the viewer's conception of space. When he received the National Medal of Arts from President Obama, Ellsworth Kelly's citation read, in part, a careful observer of form, color, and the natural world. Mr. Kelly has shaped more than half a century of abstraction and remains a vital influence in American art. Born in 1923, Kelly studied art and design at New York's Pratt Institute before he enlisted to serve in the Army during World War II. At the war's end, at the war's end, Kelly used the GI Bill to study at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. He then moved to Europe, ostensibly to study at the École des Beaux-Arts. But after two days, he decided he was done with art school and instead immersed himself in the culture of France. And that's where I begin my conversation with Ellsworth Kelly. We met in a D.C. hotel right before the National Medal of Arts ceremony. And you may occasionally hear the sound of the portable oxygen tank that's always with him. Here's Ellsworth Kelly talking about his days in Paris after the war. It was strange. I, I didn't know French. But I got along and uh, felt very free in Paris. <laughs> this was 1948, you see, right after the war. And I made friends in Europe and lived there six years. And you did a lot of painting while you were in Paris. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I had discovered something that I could do that was different. See, in school in Boston, I had a teacher that we only painted the nude in the afternoon. We drew from the nude. But in doing that, you learned more or less how to apply paint and make a picture. So when I got to Paris, I said, well, what am I going to do here? French art was very personal. I mean, I felt like Picasso, Matisse, were very personal and it was figurative. So I became fascinated with the School of Paris painting. It was was like Picasso was on your back, really. That's what I felt when I was saying personal. And I said that somehow I wanted to be impersonal. And I wanted to present color and form so that it was a visual thing. And I feel that the art of observation was very necessary for that to present pure color. And that was the beginning because I said, uh, after a few months, I don't want to do what I've seen. I want to do something that I haven't seen, meaning I want to turn abstraction. And that was a steady workout all six years. So I discovered I did some very good work there that now is in museums. When I got back to, uh, to New York, color was my strong point and color in the spectral way. If you see a rainbow or a spectrum, it meant using all the colors, liking all the colors, not having any color dislikes. And when I came back, I had developed doing work on panels, in some way making the art object, I called it a tableau objet, and uh, I felt that The painting was the form, and the ground was the wall. I used the wall in in titles of works, like Colors for a Large Wall, 
What was happening in the New York art world when you returned? When I we came back to New York, it was the height of the abstract expressionists with Pollock and de Kooning and Rothko and Barnett Newman still were the big men. And in Europe, at, in the early 50s, there were no magazines. And so I didn't know what was going on in New York. And I felt when I came back, it was all gesture. And so I had to really continue. I mean, what else could I do? I think that I started something in Paris, and I've just continued. And do it my whole, say, 70 years of painting has been a continuation of development. And the new work, I feel I couldn't do it unless I've done all the work that I've done before. And perhaps that any artist can say that. So all those paintings were a foundation which I felt like had been for me on the cutting edge of developing something that was very personal, but in an impersonal way. And I used to say, I want to take the I out of painting. Well, the thing that's so impressive that is noteworthy about your work, many things, but you look at a piece of yours and Mm. you know that this is Ellsworth Kelly's work, yet it is without narcissism. And that is a feat. I like what you said about that because I I had no one has ever said that to me. But you did catch the fact that what I went through with the impersonality. I said I didn't want to sign my pictures. I signed them on the back. And I said that I just want to develop with chance. I know I, I read all about and saw exhibited a lot of the surrealists, which interested me because of what they did, and the Dadaist. And chance came up. And fortunately, one day I met John Cage. He was staying at the same hotel for a week or so. And this was before you returned to New York when you were in Paris. Oh, yeah, this yeah. is, this is the, the first year, in 1949. And I didn't know who he was. A friend of mine came in who was always looking at the book down in the lobby of the hotel and said, oh, you have some interesting guests here, Merce Cunningham and John Cage. And, and the next day, as I was leaving the hotel, I heard someone behind me saying, oh, hello there. And I turned around. It was John, and uh, he said... I see you coming out of the hotel. What are you doing? Well, I said, I'm painting. And he said, oh, I want to see what you're doing. So, you know, that was the first time that anybody, like a stranger, would show some interest. And as if it was a way of life, you know, being a painter. And I took my paintings, which I was just starting to do. This was in May of 49. So I just was getting settled. And they liked the paintings. And then they left. And they came back, I guess, six or eight months later, just to touch base with Paris again. And I didn't know very much about his method then. The business of chance, and it was before John was really getting into chance, I think. So I didn't really talk very much. But I think the fact that they were so wonderful together, and they showed interest, and I I liked their spirit, and I probably just caught the spirit. Because then I wrote to John. I don't know if you've seen that letter. I don't. I haven't, no. I sent him some photographs, and one of the lines was, to hell with pictures. They should be on walls. But anyway, chance had a lot to do with choosing the colors, and the big thing was cutting up a painting into panels and rearranging them the colors by chance. So I had a different color theory, I suppose, that got from Europe, like, uh, you know, starting with the Fauves, with Matisse and Brock doing very colorful paintings. And then in 1910, I guess, um, Kandinsky was working at the same time Picasso was and Brock were doing the um, Cubism. So... When I came back, I had a show in 56 with Betty Parsons, and it was almost completely ignored. So I had to fight to do what I wanted to do. I continued to do a few panel pictures, paintings made up of different panels. 
But most of, the, most of the work I did in the late 50s was color, not, say, on one canvas, sort of the form and ground, a shape and another, a two, two or three shapes. And the shadowing. Yeah. Well, the shadows, of course, was part of the um, chance. There's one painting is at San Francisco it's called Cite. It's made up of 20 panels. And on each panel, there are black stripes. And when I did that, I know I showed it in Paris right after I did it in 1951. And the dealer thought it was too lively. It was a very good gallery. It's called the Gallery Mag. And so the curator of the gallery stood with me and said, no, we've got to show this. And then all the young painters came to the show and they said, oh, this is the best picture in Paris at the moment. And I knew that I had done something quite different because it was kind of an object. And then I started working with the Seine River. I lived on the Ile Saint-Louis. And every night when I would come back, I would see the lights from the bridge flickering on the water. And I said, I want to get that in a picture, and I don't want to do a pointillist picture. So I decided to do it by chance, and I made a grid, a huge grid, in black and white, and pulled out the first column, one little rectangle, the second column, two, three, four, five, six, until in the middle, it was all black. And then I continued the other side. So that was very important because I captured the chance choice of where the marks went, and I developed that right away into color with 18 different hues of color. And that spectrum yeah. arranged and by the chance. Spectrum. The first spectrum was 1953, and then when I came back, I felt like people weren't using color strongly. I mean, Barnett Newman was, but he would use maybe dark blue or dark red sometimes. But the other expression is the color was always mixed colors, not very strong, not what I call spectral, at color in its strong spectral sense. And then, uh, so I think that the big sculpture, which I did in 56, was the summation of what I had done in Europe. You mean the sculpture for a yeah, large wall. wall? And luckily, the, the uh, pop artists brought color into it, yeah. So slowly, people have warmed up to what my painting was. And uh, right now, I guess there has been, uh, because of my age, for the 90th birthday. You're having shows all over. (laughs) This is very difficult to express. When I do a painting, it has to mean something to me. And when I look at art, I use that same judgment. And I see a lot of the abstraction is just decorative. So I don't feel the sense that this has to be. Um, that may be hard for other people to, to see. But I think that when an idea comes to me, it's sort of like a flash. I've done quite a bit of sculpture in the last few years. And uh, this gentleman, he invited me to his property. And he said, I want you to do something here. He's a big, big collector and uh, has a lot of sculpture in his properties. And so I said to myself, I have to wait until something comes to me. And I kept thinking, I'm not going to start drawing or not going to start trying to find something. After weeks, weeks, all of a sudden I said, yes. There's a panel, quite big. The whole thing is 30 feet. This goes up at an angle, and then this one goes shooting out. I mean, it's just so simple that I saw it. And did you use color with this? It's white. It's white. Yeah. The large pieces I've been doing recently, there's one at Beiler in Basel, then three other white sculptures happen, and they're all very quite large and all white. And to have steel, quite heavy, come out of the ground and go this way, and then to hold on to this, This has to be much lighter, but it looks like the same. You have to see it, though, I guess. I mean, it is about perception and how I say you have to feel something for it. I guess my, what would you say it, my my whole oeuvre is to be positive and clear. 
you know, you think about the Renaissance and how I mean, read a lot about the Renaissance history and uh, all the wars, but there was such great painting done that time. And we're living in, in really quite difficult times now. I mean, you're living here in Washington. Yes. Yeah. So I somehow feel like I do read political things, but I feel like um, it's very difficult for an artist who's doing something that is, say, a luxury and also something that is part of the, our culture and has nothing to do with, you know, everyday problems. But it's bread and roses, no? Pardon? Bread and roses, the old yeah. union song. We need oh. bread, but we need roses, too. <laughs> yeah, that's very good, yes. I know you've just been to the Barnes Museum to see some of your work. When you look at your work again, do you see it with new eyes? Well, I have several sculptures at Barnes, and there's a very large red curve. And when I looked at it yesterday, I was with some friends, and I said, that's a lot of red on the wall. And I think that's what large curve, and it comes down like, like a fan, in a way. And uh, I think that that was the push I had, is I wanted somehow to get that out of me. You know, I, I think that Matisse had said something about that, too, that he felt that he was just the man who made it. But how, how did he say it? That you're a kind of a medium. Like a conduit. Yes, a conduit. Yes, of course. Well, I'm curious about when you moved off the wall, because the wall had been so important. As you said, it was the field for your painting. Yeah. But then with the Gates series, you, you moved off the wall. Yeah. When I started... Before, in Paris, the early things were all reliefs. And I had been traveling all through France. And Romanesque and Byzantine work influenced me very much. And so a lot of the early cloisters in the south of France are beautiful buildings. The sculptural quality of those buildings, I wanted to capture that as well. Because I feel that early work, the very say, early Greek and early Egyptian, early Chinese, the Cyclades, very early pieces, all those things had spiritual quality. And I guess I, I'm not religious, but I feel that I want to do something that has some, some spiritual quality. I mean, that comes by itself, I guess. I'm not religious, I don't preach or anything. But when I make the work, I feel like I am a kind of, uh, what do you call me? A, a, a conduit. A conduit. And it makes me very critical. Of, of your own art. work or no, of the, other oh, art? Of other art, yeah. But it sets me apart, I suppose. But I think now, because I'm not one of the hot shots, and they're getting enormous prices in the millions and millions of dollars, you know. And uh, I always felt like money is not really involved in art, but it has become very, very important. But I feel like uh, I'm the old school in a way. I, I mean, I feel like I still love the school of Paris, like Brancusi and Mondrian, and all those painters. I got to know several when I lived in France. And I, in a way, I'm saying I'm painting for them because, you know, you realize how important Picasso and Brock and Mondrian were. Do you feel like you're engaged in a conversation with them almost? Like they made a statement and you're talking yeah. with them? Well, I, I find they're like father figures in some way. I'm curious about Brancusi because I'm a yeah. great, great fan. Oh, yeah. Well, I went to see him. One day I called up. This was probably 50... 51, maybe. And he answered the phone. And he said, uh, who are you? What do you want? You know, and I said, I'd like to know if I could come see you, see your work. And he said, Thursday at 2 o'clock. <laughs> hung up. He had Thursdays afternoons for anyone that came. So I, I went with two of my friends, two painters. And there was some, a few other people there, but he liked us, they were, we were young artists. And I remember he was all dressed in white. 
at one point he sat down and said, come over here and we'll talk, you know. And it was such purity in there. You know, I mean, the form of his works and the way he had done it, you know, he, he was a master. And I certainly was influenced by that, that group of artists. When we left, he had tears in his eyes and he said, boys, you don't have to leave, you know, because he was lonely. And he died probably, I think, a few years after that. It was like seeing a saint, you know. He was funny. And there was a photograph that he had there. It was a photograph, it was a piece of branch of a tree. And he said that when he was ill, he had asked a friend to bring him this piece of wood. And uh, someone asked me, what was the lesson that he taught you? And I said, well, when I left, he said, get a piece of wood and contemplate it. <laughs> well, you've been doing that with plants, but you had been yes, doing that since you oh, were a kid. Plant, yeah. Well, the plant drawings are drawing, you see. And I had a very good drawing teacher in Boston. And he took me in hand because he liked what I was drawing, but he said, you can't see, really. And he would take a pencil and make three lines. He said, your shoulder is flat. You don't see it right. And here became a shoulder. And I said, how did you do that? And he said, I'm going to teach you how to see. And when you can see, you can draw anything. So I love to draw. And I did, I've done a lot of drawings of people, which I've never shown because that was Boston, I had friends, and I used to draw constantly. And I went to Paris and I had to draw. So I think I began doing plants when I went out to Brittany and spent a summer. I started doing some plants and, and uh, seaweeds. When, then I came back and I started drawing plants in 57. Uh, I, I grew plants and drew them. And I said, it's good to have a subject that's changeable that I can continue keeping my hand in. And so I would draw daily, you know. And I think drawing over a period of time with what that teacher had taught me, I wasn't inventing. I was drawing flat leaves, like one leaf is in front of another one, and then another one's here. And he said, you have to think of overlaps and how you build up like a collage, like uh, Picasso and Braque were doing with collage work. And uh, I've done a, an awful lot of collages all my life in studies for paintings. I mean, we've covered a lot of ground here. Is there anything you want to talk about? Well, I think that um, one thing that I would like to talk about was about when I was a child, I was ill for a while, and my grandmother and my mother gave me a bird book. And when I got well, I went out to the pine forest behind the house and began being a bird watcher. And the first bird was a little red start, which is very small, warbler, black with red bars on his wings. And I said, I don't need abstraction. <laughs> That's my abstraction. You know, they're like objects of beautifully colored. And I think my color started with that. And the other thing I wanted to mention was that when Pollock or de Kooning made a painting, they found the painting by doing it, by making it. And we used to say, when did they know when to stop? You always have to have a man behind you with a hammer to stop it when, at the right time. But I don't find pictures that way. I find them with these ideas I have and development over what I've done before, and I have to plan it. I plan it with drawings and collage. And then, for instance, the stretches are, are different, so I have to know what, what I need. So I work it all out, and then I make the painting. And getting to know the painting is different than the small collage or the drawings. And now that I'm older and I look back at early things, some of those early things I wasn't able to paint. And there was one painting in the alcove, which was white, black, and red in panels. That was an early collage that was maybe in the 50s or the 60s. 
And I've been going through them, and all of a sudden, I say, oh, I can do that now. I mean, now I'm allowed to do it. There's a collage I did in 1962 in my last show with Matthew Marks. It was a collage of two small orange curves at the bottom of a large gold panel, gold paint. And it's been a great success. Everyone talks about it. And I'd done that in 62, and I liked it, but I wasn't able to paint it then. And since I've been doing relief works, one panel on another, that I wanted a real object. I didn't want a copy. Or the illusion of an the object. Illusion, yeah. So I had to get to the point where I said, all painting has been an illusion. Like the Renaissance painting, it's all on one canvas. It's like a window that you're looking out of. That led me to think that that lasted until Mr. Cezanne and Monet. They began to upset the surface. So the content really in Cezanne was how your eye goes to how he did it on the surface. And he wasn't a mirror of a landscape, but he was doing a painting of Marx. So with Monet too, and especially his late paintings, which I went to the studio in 52 and saw all those late uh, large paintings. The next day I went back to my studio. I had done panels in five different colors, and that was a turn, turning point to me when I was, had gone to the south of France. And then I said, I wonder if I can do a painting, a monochrome in one canvas or one board. I think I had a wooden board. So I painted a green panel because Monet did all his water lilies and grass underwater. And then I looked at it and said, this is 52, you know, and I said, oh, it doesn't mean anything. I wrapped it up and I didn't look at it again until sometime in the 80s. I mean, 30 years, it was all wrapped up. And I was invited to a show in southern, in France, in Lyon, of the color Sol. And so he was talking about, he wanted to borrow, he borrowed eight pictures of mine for the show. And then somehow or other, I rem remembered that I had done this one panel. So I unwrapped it. And I sent him a, a slide of it. I call it uh, Tableau Vert. And he wrote back and said, oh, we'll put this in the historical section because it's really one of the first monochromes. I think a lot of people do monochromes that are rectangles now. There's a lot of monochrome painting, different ways of painting it. But I think it has to have a shape as well to make it interesting for me to do it. Are we getting close? We are. We really do need to stop now. And I'm so sorry we do because I'm just loving this conversation. Is it okay? It is wonderful. Right. Thank you. And thank you for your questions. <laughs> thank you so much. That was 2012 National Medal of Arts recipient, artist Ellsworth Kelly. The White House has just announced the 2013 medalists. They include authors Julia Alvarez and Maxine Hong Kingston. Check out their podcasts. Go to arts.gov and click on National Medal of Arts. You've been listening to Artworks, produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. Next week, the director of the Young People's Chorus and MacArthur Genius Grant recipient, Francisco Nunez. For the National Endowment for the Arts, I'm Josephine Reed. Thanks for listening.